Oh, hey guys, welcome back to the Indie Game Culture channel. Do you know what games really blow my mind? Time loop games. The concept of time has always been a pretty cool thing to mess around with, whether it be using a flux capacitor to send a DeLorean into the past, or travelling to a planet where seconds equate to hours on Earth. The fact is there's just no end to the things that you can do with the concept of time, and gaming in the last decade has obviously got the memo, hence the influx of games featuring time loops. Now don't get me wrong, time loops have been around in gaming since the days of Majora's Mask, and while that format did have some issues and made you rush through a lot of the content, it still offers a story-rich experience with a very competent time loop mechanic. But recently, there has been a new wave of these Groundhog Day scenario games, some good and some bad, but all doing their part to make the time loop game a subgenre in its own right. What I'm getting at here is there is a hunger for games of this nature, a desire to ignore Vass's iconic line from Far Cry 3 and repeat the same actions over and over, expecting different results. And yet in December 2023, something quite peculiar happened. One of the most charming, adorable, clever and competently made time loop games I have ever witnessed released with little to no fanfare, something that both stunned and aggravated me to no end. So I guess this is a plea of sorts, with all of you guys missing this one in December with the holidays looming large and so many games to play in your backlog already. You need to make some time for In Stars and Time. It's probably the best time loop game I have ever played, and here's why. Before we explain why In Stars and Time is so special, we need to get a lay of the land as far as time loop games are concerned, and looping games in general for that matter. The way I see it, you have two types of looping games. Games like The Outer Wilds, 12 Minutes and Minute, where you have a certain period of time to effect change before the time loops and you have to go back and do it all again. Then you have roguelike looping games with narrative focuses like Hades, where each loop pushes the story forward and you can upgrade with each death, but time isn't so much of a factor as say adding 3% damage to your weapon or something arbitrary like that. For the purposes of this video, I want to take roguelike loopers out of the equation here just because I feel like they're their own entity, so I just want to focus on those that make time the primary focus. That leaves behind a select few games, and to showcase just what In Stars and Time is up against, we need to showcase the best of the best where time loops are concerned. I could talk about some sparkling examples here like The Forgotten City and its elaborate puzzle based around the golden rule. I could talk about Minute's microscopic approach to time loops by offering only one minute long runs at a time, or I could discuss 12 Minute's claustrophobic approach to time looping by keeping the whole story confined to one little apartment. But in the end, there's only one game that is truly worthy of fighting in the opposite corner against this plucky newcomer. It's hard to ignore the sheer brilliance of Outer Wilds, a pocket solar system where you have 23 minutes to get out there, explore planets, uncover information left behind by the Nomai, and through doing this, you slowly discover pieces of the puzzle that you can put together allowing you to unravel the time paradox keeping you penned in. Where this game succeeds is that your reward for each loop is discovery and very little else. You don't get XP, you don't unlock new weapons or gear, what you get is a feeling much like clicking a jigsaw piece into place, and you can do this over and over until you finally have a complete picture. Then of course there is the added thrill of exploration in a world where there are no map markers and no objectives outside of Break the Time Loop. You can head off in any direction and every planet serves as a point of interest with unique biomes and mechanics, each acting as a hurdle to overcome. Each planet is intriguing on its own, but it's the way that each planet and indeed everything in this game is intrinsically linked to one another. It's rare that a loop in this game will not lead to a fun discovery or a clue which will lead you to make connections across the stars. And this is what makes Outer Wilds such a successful time loop. Not to mention the world building, the silent narrative, the traversal mechanics and the soundtrack are sublime. I'm sorry, this isn't an Outer Wilds video, I promise, but man, that game was something special. Up until very recently, Outer Wilds was easily the best time loop game that I had ever played. 
But that's the thing about time, it turns to be a cruel mistress and in 2023 there was a new game on the scene looking to dethrone the Outer Wilds as the best time loop game of all time. And the funny thing is, I think In Stars and Time managed to do that without practically the entire gaming world noticing. Alright, so what is In Stars and Time and why the hell should I care, I hear you ask. Well, In Stars and Time is a game created by Insert Disc 5, which plays like a traditional JRPG adventure in a lot of ways. You begin in the region of Vygard in the town of Dormant and step into the shoes of a traveller called Sifrin. You are one of five saviours who plan to storm the castle and take on the king, an evil villain who has frozen the realm in time. In a lot of ways, it couldn't be more basic in terms of its narrative approach and, from the outside looking in, that's maybe why so many potential players turned a blind eye on release day, but it's through this simplicity that the narrative can grow in complexity, stacking layers upon layers of intrigue with each passing loop like a big time loop trifle. But we'll get into that later. As for gameplay, the game is very much like an RPG maker game like Undertale or Mori, where most time spent playing will be walking around and interacting with objects and NPCs, with the only thing breaking up that exploration and dialogue being the combat sections when exploring the castle. This combat system is both hilarious and genius in its simplicity, as it basically boils down turn-based RPG combat seen in things like Pokemon and makes each encounter an elaborate game of rock, paper, scissors, which when you think about it, is what every single RPG game does, only they use fancy typings and magical nonsense words to hide it from us. Each character has a type, being rock, paper or scissors, and will also have some unique abilities called crafts, which are essentially magic spells, but that's about as intricate as it gets. It's just interesting enough to be fun and satisfying to engage with repeatedly, but also not complex enough to stall your progression from loop to loop for too long. Now at this point you may be wondering, how the hell is this RPG Maker game that makes me play rock, paper, scissors on a loop a groundbreaking RPG time loop experience? Well, that's where the time looping comes in. I think the best way to tackle this appraisal of In Stars and Time is to come at it chronologically and explore the themes of the loop as it unfolds. The first hurdle the game has to clear in terms of design is getting the player invested in the story, in the characters present, and also essentially offering a control test. The first day is essentially creating a status quo, which you will then rip and tear apart to suit your needs in future loops. This could have been a potentially boring process as this essentially means a bucket load of exposition right from the word go, but thankfully the game manages to keep the player engaged thanks to excellent world building, zany humour and character depth in abundance. The characters present have clear motives, quirks, chemistry with one another and most importantly they are all likeable from the get-go. Right from the off I adored the group dynamic, was enthralled by the writing, the world building within a pocket sized starting town and before I even got to the tutorial on combat I felt like I knew all of these people intimately and I was rooting for them which is a sign of really good writing. Then comes the opening gambit of the game which is pretty straightforward. Get through the castle, confront the king, and through the power of friendship, kill the big baddie. It's the standard RPG staple we've all come to expect, but the thing is, things don't quite work out that way, and you pretty much die immediately. Bummer, I know, but as you might have guessed, that isn't the end of our story. This initiates the time loop mechanic where players are taught that they can experiment and affect change down to a pretty microscopic level. Some changes you make might be to avoid a huge boulder falling on your head and killing you, whereas others might be as simple as choosing a different snack when resting between floors of the castle or choosing a different companion to gift a pretty flower. And it's here with the opening day firmly established and the ability to mess around with all of these little details within this day that the world of In Stars and Time really opens up and the game shows its value. It may sound a bit corny 
and it may sound like I'm doing PR for this game, but in this case, it actually holds true. Every loop is like a new adventure. I think I could count on one hand the number of loops I went through in this game where my actions in the previous loop didn't alter the next. And we're talking literally over 100 loops here, so that is no small achievement. From the moment you loop back for your second try, you already have lots of this or that decisions that you can alter to see what happens. And while that's very easy to do a few times at the start, this trend continues loop to loop, with conversations usually leaving you with the, huh, I wonder if I'd have done that instead feeling. I will concede that in the opening loops, you do still feel a little bit like you're on guide rails as the game explains the frozen tier system, which allows you to trigger loops of your own accord. And the game will also create scenarios where only through doing certain things wrong can you loop back and correct your error. But after time, the game gradually lets go and lets you treat Dormant as your own little time travel playground. This builds up to the supposed crescendo where you've learned so much about your companions, you've conquered all the puzzles and traps before you, you stand before the king with all the necessary skills to beat them and restore order to the world, and for most RPGs, this would be the last grand hurrah and the game lets you believe that it is. There's a feeling of euphoria as you overcome adversity, defying the odds to take down a literal deity. There's a feeling of complete togetherness as you strike down the king. And if the game had ended there, this would still have been a pretty serviceable indie RPG. But I see this isn't your first lip, and I see you're one step ahead of me. Upon reaching the moment any other game's credits probably would have ruled, you are forced against your will to loop back to where it all began, which is when you realize that you're only now through the looking glass. With the grand goal achieved and the facade of the traditional JRPG adventure crumpled on the floor before you, it now becomes clear that this game has a time paradox puzzle for you to solve after all. And to go about doing that, you have three pathways to success. Help your friends, analyse the king, and try to understand the inner workings of the loop. This seems like a pretty daunting task to take on alone, which is probably a good moment to mention that you haven't been alone since the second loop. You meet a sentient star called Loop, who acts as your <coughs> guiding star, offering subtle hints and clues as to where your next point of interest might be. But the marvellous thing about all this is you've seen practically every room and asset in the game already, so it's down to you how to use that info to affect change. You might go about this by beating your head against the wall stubbornly, by beating the king over again expecting a new ending. You might believe that through the power of friendship, bonding with your team will break the cycle, or you may get lost in the minutia of seeing how many different ways you can make Sifrin die. My point is, even though you've literally played the entire game, and minus a few small details, nothing really changes from here on out, there is still so much pushing you onward to do it again and again. It's the unanswered questions that pull you back in despite saving the world already. It's the lack of knowledge you have about your own player character that makes you want to learn more about him. It's the king's probing do you remember line that makes you want to question him all the more. It's the mere presence of Loop that makes you ask who the hell even are you? This ambiguity, along with minor tweaks to the script, make this Groundhog Day RPG so damn replayable. Despite the fact that the game is scripted very carefully, it still manages to feel like a sandbox where you are in complete control. But from the moment you beat the king, the gameplay dynamic changes drastically without the world ever changing at all. You often play through two hours of the same process just for a new item or a minor dialogue change, and the once novel combat system soon becomes a rather tiresome and tedious slog, which will have you snake around sadnesses to try and avoid them at all costs. The amusing puns and the charming repartee between your pals loses its charm fast, and you find yourself using the dialogue skip function more and more to refine and optimise your loop, and the puzzles to find the keys and clues soon become muscle memory. If you were playing any other game, this would be an example of the wheels falling off and the game becoming less fun and less engaging as a whole, but the thing about In Stars and Time is, the developer has intentionally made this game repetitive to the point of frustration and boredom. And you would think, how is that an engaging gameplay mechanic? Well, the way that they get around this and the way that they take these themes and make them the core of what makes In Stars and Time great is through making the game so damn meta. 
In Stars and Time is a very brave game. I can count on one hand the number of games I've ever played that have used tedium as a core mechanic or theme within the game, and even less have done that successfully. But thanks to the staggeringly good writing, connective design, and pacing, the game manages to walk this tightrope expertly. As mentioned, the first few loops are filled with charm, enthusiasm from all parties, and there is a sense of wonder that comes with exploring the unknown. But when the king falls, this feeling of wonder is awarded to the player less and less. It's almost like a drug addiction. The first few hits knock your socks off, and then with time, the same dose can't scratch the itch anymore. So to balance this out, the game regularly gives you a little injection of humour, a narrative revelation, or a clever callback, and usually, the game drops it in just when you feel the inertia setting in. It's masterfully done, but you may be wondering why do it at all? Couldn't you just make the game fun from start to finish? Well, believe it or not, if In Stars and Time was a game that focused on fun above all else, it would be a much lesser game. In case you haven't gathered by now, there is only one other person who knows these loops as intimately as you do, and that's Sifrin. Sifrin has died multiple times, he's been frozen in time, has lived through two days for what could be months or years in his world, and instead of that being just part of the game's format, instead we see the effects this has on Sifrin as he descends into madness. When we first meet Sifrin, he is an aloof, an easygoing character, very nonchalant, and generally pretty upbeat. He leads the group with pride, and is known for his great listener trait on account of him not being much of a talker. But as loops progress, we see Sifrin become more desperate by invading people's privacy, manipulating people to get what he wants, becoming progressively more irritable, zoning out of conversations, or speeding them up any way he can, even becoming accustomed to death to the point that he'll stab himself with a dagger and have his friends watch him bleed out just to avoid walking a little bit further to use a frozen tear. And the justification to all of this is, it all resets the next loop anyway. As a game reviewer, I play a lot of games, and it means that I'm very good at disengaging from the content and suspending disbelief. But In Stars and Time doesn't let that happen. It forces you, the person, to engage with the content, not just the player. And that's what makes it so incredible. You share the same slow downfall that Sifrin endures, you learn the pathways like the back of your hand just as he does, you stab yourself with the knife and normalise suicide for a quicker loop time, effectively becoming a speedrunner toying with the lives of your friends for sport, without ever realising it. In Stars and Time breaks your resolve, reprograms how you engage with an RPG, and turns you into a lunatic hell-bent on escape by any means. And through this unique and disorientating narrative device, we get to witness a very personal and very touching story of a young man coming to terms with his fear of being alone, his fear of letting others in, and his fear of being his true self. It deals with these heavy themes of depression, crippling self-doubt, suicide, and more. And without this war of attrition that is the time loop, I don't think any of these themes would have been done justice or hit quite as hard. Then comes the final gauntlet of the last loop, where at the peak of your lunacy, Sifrin opts to go it alone and kill the king himself, and this is where the developer uses the gameplay mechanics and design against you for one final bit of genius. They showcase Sifrin's ridiculous power by having them slay bosses that stumped you before without so much as entering the battle screen, something that would be very cathartic in any other RPG, but here it adds to the level of concern for him. Then the game uses your established routes and your muscle memory against you by reversing the hallways, making the doors lead elsewhere, or having you enter doorways again and again until they work as desired making hallways significantly longer, and altering rooms beyond recognition to reflect how fragmented and broken Sifrin's mind has become. How broken your mind has become. Now I could dig down into the rabbit holes and the theories, I could dig down into the different individual characters and their storylines, and I could dig into that final loop finale, but I don't want to do that. That is yours to experience alone. I don't want to strip that away from you because that's the magic of In Stars and Time. That is the crescendo that it builds up to and that should be yours and I will make sure that it is. But I will say that even though there is a nastiness and a cruelty to this game, 
there is something magical about it as well. So please stick with it the entire way through because there is that payoff at the end. So there you have it, that's In Stars and Time chronologically from start to finish. I think my love for this game is something that a lot of casual players that need addicting mechanics and vibrant shapes and colours at all times to play a game at length just won't get. Ultimately, it's an extension of the whole games as art debate that I find myself fighting quite a lot and I tend to be on the side of yes, a game can be art or an interactive experience and if the game isn't inherently fun, that doesn't make it a bad game. It just makes it something you have to look deeper to find the meaning and enjoyment of. Some of my favourite games of all time are like this. Pathologic 2 is a game I go to bat for regularly and is a game filled with strife, impossible decisions, intentionally cumbersome mechanics. For all intents and purposes it just isn't a fun game in the slightest. And then you have a game like Papers Please which is a boring, bureaucratic admin job gamified to offer a silent narrative that carries the burden of the boring gameplay on its shoulders and they are just a few examples. What I'm saying here is In Stars and Time isn't going to be an indie darling and I get that and that's fine but it's sure as hell going to be mine. It's not just a great time loop game with a meta approach to storytelling, it's an artistically masterful game, it's a game filled with interesting characters each with their own story to tell, it's a game that is jam packed with lore, it's a game that even though all fictitious embraces all creeds, cultures, genders and sexualities not using them as token tropes but normalising them and making them a core thread of the narrative and it's a very competent RPG in its own right as well. So I guess this is my plea to all of you indie fans out there. Play in Stars and Time, give it the time of day. Go and make friends along the way as you break the time loop, descend into madness by Sifrin's side. And remember, don't eat the pineapple slices. You're allergic. So that for me is why in Stars and Time is, oh no, 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 no. So that is it for In Stars and Time. Thank you so much for watching the video to this point. It was a long one. It's something different for the channel. But if you liked it, let us know in the comments. Like and subscribe if you want to see more. I do want to hear what you think about this game. I want to hear what you think about our content. And if you like and subscribe and give us the support, maybe we can do it more frequently and do more things like this. Thank you so much for watching. And until next time, I've been Cal. See you later.